I forgot to bring my towel. I have multitudinous things to say about this. And by horse the way, flesh. like horse flesh is what you say when you go to an auction and you go, I like that horse flesh. Hi, I'm Debbie and this is Joe. And we're here with the Real Watchlist Plus to do this month yeah. films from the 1960s that are groovy, man, from the flower power. Groovy, man, groovy. And the movie we're doing today is Point Blank from 1967. I'm hit. With a cool guy. Ow! Ooh. Point Blank from 1967. We saw this on Tubi, so hopefully you'll be able to see it on Tubi or stream it on some other service. But I want to tell a basic thing about the plot. It's one of those cool guy movies from the 1960s. I say, let's talk about how we voted. How we Oh, I forgot about that. Oh my God, yeah, it's real watch list. This is what we do. So, who wants ready? to turn first? On the count of three. One, One two, two, three. three. Wow. wow. Wow, not cool, man, not cool. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm done with the art thing and the paddles because people see that and I don't want them to think it's no. a rose arch test or something because I can't draw. I enjoyed it. It was tough on the first go ahead, but you know what? Let's get into the film. Let's get into the cast. How many times did you watch this thing? <sighs> One and a half. Okay, I had never seen it before. Okay. So I watched it. I don't know that I really liked the film and think it was a great film, but it was so nostalgic to the 60s. That's what I really liked about it. So Lee Marvin plays Walker, whose mission is to have revenge on being double-crossed, not only by his best friend, but also his wife. And throughout the whole movie, he's trying to get that money back that they stole from Alcatraz. Mm -hmm. And I see you got some Alcatraz there, too. Oh, yes, 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 yes. This is the end of the film where it ends. And, not, and that's not a spoiler, believe me. But the interesting thing is Alcatraz had been closed since 1963. And this was 1967, okay? So to get it ramped up for the film company, which I believe was uh, MGM, mm -hmm. they uh, had to put all the electric on. They had to get heaters on. They had to get food out there, everything. Right. I heard that it was like $2,000 a day just to film. And that's a lot for back then. And I want to say I did get to visit Alcatraz. I was there twice. Really? For what crimes? No crimes. No black but and white? But they did put me in solitary. They uh, because, yeah, well, it's part of the thing. Can but, I do that again? What? Put you in solitary. <laughs> oh, my God. Try it. Try it. I'll bring a file. I'll <laughs> chew my way out. Want to go into the cast a little sure. bit? Sure. Lee Marvin plays Walker, the main character, who's no. been double-crossed by his wife and his best friend. They're on a heist to steal money out of Alcatraz. And as they're ready to take the money, um, his best friend double-crosses him, beats him up, throws him in the, in the cell, and his wife and the best friend go away. Mm -hmm. And that's where it all starts. It starts from him, so he's kind of groggy. He's kind of like not sure where he is. And that's the interesting part of the film. Well, because he was supposed to be dead. Right. They thought he was dead. Right. And as you actually realize that, is he dreaming? Is he dead? Um, the film doesn't follow a simple pattern of like a chronological order. It jumps back and forth. So it, it goes forward, then it goes back. And you, a lot of reviewers thought that maybe he wasn't alive. Maybe this was ah. part of him being dead and sort of a, like a, a spirit that was carrying him through the memories of, of revenge and justice and to get that money back. Because if you look at the film and you watch Lee Marvin, that's all he wants. Why are you doing this, Walker? I want my money. Right. I want my money. It wasn't about anything else but the money. So it was kind of weird. You really, this was like a thought provoking kind of, I, I want to say something, because sure. when he goes after his wife, who supposedly cheats on him with the, the bad guy that he's after, the color palette changes. His wife has all these beautiful colored bottles of perfume, and they get smashed, and they all fuse together in the psychedelic style going down the drain. And then from that point, the movie changes to like a darker, more morose color palette, mm -hmm. and as it progresses to the end, the color will change. And a lot of filmmakers do that. They use color palettes in film. And you don't even know subliminally that it's changing the mood of the audience that they want to right. have see it. And it touched on a lot of interesting um, points. I mean, 
there was a three-way tryst between Walker oh, yeah. and Mal, who's his best friend, yes, and and his wife Lynn, um, which you really it, it's not outright. But you kind of get it as he's flashing back. Yeah. The times they were, they were together, the, everyone's happy, the three of them together. And then the wife kind of confesses that, you know, she was married to Walker, but he had a thing for his bestie, and uh, which was kind of like, interesting for the 60s. And then what was also interesting, too, is just the use of sound when he's taking a long walk through the, uh, through the building. And, and uh, you hear the steps. Yeah. That's a really big thing in that movie. They talk about it a lot. And it was arresting to watch that because you go like, why are his feet so loud? Why did the, you know, the sound person do that? And Lee Marvin, interestingly enough, was in a lot of war type movies. Hmm. He was like the it man at the mm -hmm. time, the strong type. Yeah. Um, and offset, he actually had a problem with his best friend on the, um, in the movie, his best friend, John Vernon, who he had said that he wasn't tough enough to be in that role. Exactly. Matter of fact, it was a I did fight read that. Yeah. I did read that, but I had that fight scene, and he Lee actually hit him hard, and he screamed out, um, "I'm an actor, not a fighter." Right. And Lee later said that he thought that made that scene better because he was so pissed off at Lee that he actually fought back. So, and do you know who John Vernon is? Do you remember? People might know Dean Wormer in Animal, Animal House. Animal House, that's it. It was Dean oh Wormer. My God. That's more famous than anything yes. he ever did. Carol O'Connor's in it from All in the Family. He's very instrumental. And Lloyd Bachner, mm -hmm. who was on Dynasty. So people remember because these actors, after they had the run and the studio started breaking up and, you know, things like that, they had a big run on television. So we know people because we're, I guess, old enough to know them from movies right. into the TV zone. And it's funny because I remember watching these actors in TV first. And then as I'm watching these films, oh, that's, you know, that's yeah. Archie Bunker. Yeah, did you and, remember and the guy from Dynasty? I don't know if you watched Dynasty. I did, I did watch Dynasty. Oh. I'm gay. I watched Dynasty. Okay, come on. yeah, I liked it too. The clothes. Yeah, well, the Joan, clothes. Joan oh, come on, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but let's mention... Your favorite in the movie. My favorite, Angie Dickinson. She oh. was my all-time favorite. Um, as a young boy, I watched her on Police Woman. That's actually where I saw her first. And I actually had to school people on who Angie Dickinson was. If the producer of this uh, production company remembers Darren. She didn't know who Angie Dickinson was. Like, How could you Get remember? out. She was a strong woman. Police Woman was the show. Um, and I, I really admired her. And I actually wanted to dig deeper into Angie Dickinson. Figuratively, not literally. Yes. I want to say one thing. What Angie Dickinson, her famous quote, do you know what it is? What is it? I dress for women, but I undress for men. Can you relate? Well, I could when I was younger. So Angie Dickinson, police woman, was one of my favorite shows as a young boy watching her. And just the opening title scene when she's, you know, walking down with her legs, and she was known for her legs as an actress. That's really? one of the things that sold her to a lot of the film uh, production companies because she was just so sexy. She was in a, in a lot of exploitation <laughs> films. Uh, the other one that I loved, the movie that she was in, was Big Bad Mama. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I like that one. So she was not only um, sexy, but she also was really tough. She was friends with people like Frank Sinatra, oh. like the Rat Pack folks. She, she hung around with that crowd. But she also realized that um, people were hiring her, producers, filmmakers, because of her looks, because of her body. In a previous show, I talked about a movie that made me want to be a critic, Raging Bull. But the second one, and there were only two, well, I mean, I love movies, but was Dressed to Kill. Ugh. And that opening shot on a steady cam through the museum mm -hmm. with Angie Dickinson, and she, she did have a body double. That wasn't her naked. But that really... You just ruined it for well, me. Well, <laughs> you can pre pretend. I'll, I'll wipe your... I'm sorry, the hand. I'll wipe your brain out right now. She's still alive now. She's 92 years old. Oh, my God. I can't think of her. I think of her in my mind as, you know, when she was beautiful. I can't think of her as an older woman. No, I'm sure she's still beautiful. And I have an, an ode to Angie Dickinson, if I may. It's a song. Oh, yes. By all means. Can I do a song? Angie, if you're out there, we love you. I love you. You really made the man I am today. Well, the straight portion of me, but I'm gay. But anyway, 
Ange, Ange, you were my schoolboy fantasize with your body and your clothes. You're a knockout from head to toe. You can say you satisfy me. And yeah, I just who thought I'd turn out to be gay. Many years after Angie Dickinson was on The Police Woman, she actually remarked that she didn't like being on it because she felt it took time away from doing important film work, and also the pay was inadequate. Really? Um, but she had such an impact with Police Woman. She not only won the Golden Globe Award, but was nominated for several Emmys, um, and it actually set the tone for more TV shows about women, the bionic yeah. women, Charlie's Angels, oh, yeah. uh, put women in these kind of like, you know, law enforcement, kind of tough um, mm -hmm. pictures in, on, on TV. So, Angie, we love you. Mm. One thing uh, <laughs> about Angie Dickinson yes. is that um, Lee Marvin didn't like her. He didn't want her. That's right. Right. Of fact, yeah, right. Did you was, read that? She was so pissed off at him. Yeah. At a, a prior movie, she was in a, in a scene where Lee Marvin was hanging her over and she was scared yes. to death. But he's, he's hanging he her was over. a rough guy. He really was yes. a tough dude. He was tough and he was hanging her over the edge and she's like trying to like, 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 yo, the, we're acting here. We're not, this is not real yeah. life. So she was so mad at him that it, it actually was portrayed in Point blank. You could see, like in the fight yeah. scenes, where Angie's hitting them. Like I think yeah. she was getting revenge back oh, on probably, him yeah. from like time. scaring the shit <sighs> out of yeah. her. Yeah. But John Borman was the filmmaker, mm -hmm. and this was actually something a little bit different for John, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yes. Well, John, he was Sir John Borman. He was actually knighted, oh, no. but his film, the big film that affected us all, and when I saw it, when it was done, I saw it in a theater. I couldn't even talk. Was Deliverance? Squeal like a pig. Okay, big scene. Freaked us all out at the time. And he also did Excalibur, mm -hmm. which had a small performance by Liam Neeson. He right. wasn't known yet, Liam Neeson. And we just talked about him in another film, Gangs of New York, where he only had a small part. Uh, and then he also did Exorcist 2, which is awful, pretty much. It was much. terrible. Awful. The final scene. Yeah. She's going like this with the Yeah, locusts. it's saying Exorcist 3 it's isn't too point. bad. But I think George C. Scott's in Exorcist 3. That yeah. was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, and also a big person on this that, that stood out was William Tuttle, who was the makeup guy. Well, William Tuttle for years was a big makeup person in Hollywood. And he did all the makeup for Mel Brooks's film, who's a great comedian, Young Frankenstein. And Young Frankenstein is, I, I don't know, maybe Mel Brooks' yes. most famous film? One of his. One of them. One of the top mm -hmm. four. Something that actually young filmmakers and our younger demographic should see. So uh, younger people, go see Young Frankenstein. Find that on streaming and uh, you're gonna like it. Another thing I wanna bring up about this time period is it was the time period of the tough guy mm -hmm. in the movies. And totally off the wall because Lee Marvin just goes through everything, beating everybody up along the way and, and there's no like circumstances. Right, matter of yeah. fact, he had such a problem with the film after he saw it that he couldn't believe how violent it was and that how violent he was in the film. Um, but that's actually one of the, the things that drew people into its liking, to, to its critical acclaim, because it was just so, you know, not only with the, the look of the film and the sequence of how the film was shot, going mm -hmm. doing flashbacks, going back and forth, but the fact that it was so violent. It was like, it's sort of like the start of that uh, type of cinema where you had right. violence and sort of crime revenge kind of theme that whole and it was really prevalent in the 1960s and then went into shaft and things like that the bad guy and lee marvin only smiled once in the whole picture at the very end and That's there were some really cartoony scenes though there's a scene where he's got buying a car and he's casing the guy who's buying another car in the lot and he takes the owner of the the car lot and instead of just beating him up, he drives all around, like smashing on the brakes and going until he crashes into a bridge underpass. And I thought, I don't know, maybe back in the day when I saw it, it would be, you know, serious, mm -hmm. but it kind of made me laugh. Point 
Blanc is often cited as the, a classic neo-noir cinema right. mm -hmm. um, that was uh, something of a breakthrough in the 60s because we saw a whole change during the 60s of away from your, your nice traditional kind of you know, movies to something that was thought-provoking, kind of uh, edgy. Right. Um, and this was a great example. Matter of fact, this movie wasn't such a great success at the box office initially. It had some good reviews, but later it became sort of like a cult classic. People started following it because it was just so different from the norm. Exactly. And uh, the, the thing about it that's really crazy is the end, uh, John Borman went in to talk that he was called into the MGM office mm -hmm. by the president. And he said, this is over budget. This is out of control. I don't think you're doing a good you know, job. He was going to get really railed out. And he knew it because he had heard it with the musings of the people in the studio. And when he went into the office, the phone rang. The president answered it. It was David Lean, who just come off of, I think, Lawrence of Arabia and mm -hmm. big movies. And he wanted to cast Ryan's daughter. Mm -hmm. And the studio executive was so happy to hear from David Lean that John Borman ran out of the office and he never oh. got called in again. Oh, my God. And he said to him as he was going through the door, just make a good film. Mm -hmm. So initially when I saw it, I thought I was confused because uh, I'm like, wait, I'm waiting for, you know, this ending because the movie ends. Spoiler alert. The movie ends. He didn't get his money back or did he? Okay, well you really don't know. And the thing that's interesting about it, $93,000 is what he was, you know, bilched from. Mm -hmm. And now today that would be $864,081. Mm -hmm. So you can see why he really wanted to go after it. Right. But it's like an ambiguous ending. And the reason it is, is because John Borman was so tired and drinking at the end of the film. Ooh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That when they got to the Alcatraz scenes at the very, very end, mm -hmm. he just said to Lee Marvin, just finish the picture. Just do what oh, you, you want. I did it. No. Oh, my God. So that's how it ended. Mm -hmm. And an, another interesting thing is I love locations where they are. I love how they do that in films when they use a real one and not CGI. And the last house in the film where Walker meets, I think the character named Brown, is Drew Barrymore's house in real life. That's where she lives now. And I want to mention something important about this movie is the music composed by Johnny Mandel. Now, if you don't know Johnny, I know. especially you folks out there that are younger, he's a jazz composer, a famous American composer uh, who composed songs for people like Frank Sinatra, Shirley Horn, Count Basie. Um, he did songs like The Shadow of Your Smile. The shadow of your smile. And the theme song to <laughs> MASH, the famous uh, TV series. Okay. So um, really important. So they not only made such an interesting movie, but they also included famous composers like Johnny. So I just wanted to mention that because I think it's pretty cool that they included him. Oh my goodness, time for the watch list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So other movies. Prince of the City, starring the late Treat Williams, who just died. I think he died at the end of last year. I'm not sure, but, you know, he did the um, Truman Capote show that's on Hulu now, which is excellent. He was good looking, too. Handsome man. Yeah, I didn't know my in type. Days. Not maybe your type, not my type. Uh -huh. Anyway, <laughs> Charlie Varick, starring Walter Matthau, who was one of my favorites. He was great in serious stuff, and he was a great comedian. And last, Cutter's Way, 1981 film starring Jeff Bridges, who we just did with True Grit not too long mm -hmm. ago. So that's my watch list. And they're all good films, so check them out. And this, this movie that we just watched, Point Blank, and we're telling you about, was based on a book called Hunter, and it was remade in, with a Mel Gibson picture, Payback, which you might have seen because that's kind of, you know, I don't know when Payback was exactly, but I think it was probably the 80s, but I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that or hold me to the fire, please. So Debbie, we have a sponsor today. Who is it? Yeah, and I have the sponsor. It's the Axelrod Performing Arts Center at 100 Grand Avenue in Ocean Township, New Jersey. This is New York theater at the shore. It's a gorgeous 450 seat theater and they audition in New York, they rehearse in New York, but they do the show locally. So you're seeing New York at the shore. Wait, can I get a part at the Axelrod? Uh, are you equity? I am very equity. 
I think maybe not the same equity that oh. they're thinking. They do great things. The next show is going to be Avita from May 31st to June 16th, but they do other things too, like Best of the Eagles. They have an Elton John tribute, and they even have their own ballet company, so they do ballet. So uh, come to go to the Axelrod. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a great theater. Most people wait. don't know about it. Just check it out. Look at their website, Axelrod Theater, Ocean, New Jersey. And, and you know what? I think this is an important film for young filmmakers to watch, yeah. especially someone who wants to get into film because it truly represents something different in the 60s, that neo-noir cinema that was sort of very, very prevalent during the 1960s. True. Right. So go out there and watch Point Blank. I still hold it at an eight. Debbie? No, I'm still six. I'm not changing because it is it is dated. It is a little bit laughable in some uh, spots. Well, it is laughable, but it's the 60s. And it's also that, that time period. And it just brings you back to that kind of cool era of the 60s. And it made it something different. So I guess from the 60s, cool. groovy, yeah. Cool. Oh yeah, huh? Paisley flowers the whole deal. We're gonna say goodbye until our next episode. God only knows what it is we know, but you don't know yet. From the notorious 60s Flower Power series, The Real Watch List Plus with Joe and Debbie. Joe and Debbie. Joe and Debbie. Joe. Fade to blow. Best part of the episode. I like how Joe said he couldn't get his train of thought because looking at me made him laugh. Me off. I mean, no, really? No, you know? You had the right look. Like, it, was, it was like, she's like, oh, come on, Joe. Come on. Like,